Hello guys, welcome back to the DNA Medical Series. We're going to start today's tutorial on cardiopathology. All right, so this is the first lecture in the series. And I know that cardio and digestive systems, they can pose a challenge. They are very, very high end courses. And so it is important for you to do well in these areas. All right, so we're going to look on acute rheumatic fever and how it progresses to rheumatic heart disease in some patients plus infective endocarditis which can result from rheumatic heart disease however to know not in all cases infective endocarditis stems from rheumatic heart disease but especially in the developed countries developing countries i should say such as jamaica this is one of the major causes of infective endocarditis so we're going to start with the acute rheumatic fever so usually what will happen is that children or young adults it is more common in them and they will have like a sore throat and then six weeks after presentation of this pharyngitis they will develop an immune mediated response now, the organism that is at fault here is the group A beta-hemolytic streptococcus. Well, if you can remember from your microbiology, well, I'm hoping that you'd remember, the group A beta-hemolytic strep, what this means is that if you plate this organism on blood agar, it will hemolyze your blood cells. And so there is this yellow appearance that occurs. Now, the difference between a beta hemolytic and an alpha hemolytic is the extent to which this hemolysis takes place. So, in alpha, it's kind of like a partial, and in beta, it's like complete hemolysis. All right. So, as we said, the acute rheumatic fever, it is an immune mediated response, and we're going to look on the pathogenesis shortly. And the main presentations are carditis and arthritis. In 40% of patients, pancarditis occurs, which is inflammation of the three layers of the heart. And then the Jones criteria is used in clinical setting to diagnose patients with this disease. So in terms of the criteria, we're just gonna run it over. Um, a patient must have the presence of the group A streptococcus organism. Right, so how they do that is they can do a title, mm -hmm. they can do a throat culture, or they can do antigen testing for the presence of this organism. And there are what we call major manifestations and minor manifestations according to the Jones criteria. Now, in order to diagnose the patient, they must have the organism, as we said before, and two major symptoms, or one major and two minor. All right, so it's important for you to just get familiar with the major and minor symptoms, just know what they are. And I'll be inserting a photo here so that you can pause the video if you wish and look on that on your own time, all right? So we're going to just move on now to the pathogenesis of this disease. As we said before, the group A streptococcus organism is generally the cause and you have a preceding pharyngitis or sore throat. Now this um, group A strep has a surface protein or surface antigen called the M protein. And this antigen is similar to the R tissues which also have M protein. Now when the body is generating an immune response to get rid of this organism, right? Because it has M protein, the immune response is generated towards the M protein. But guess what? In your heart, there's also M protein. So what occurs is that your immune system actually attacks these M protein that are present in your heart as well. So there's cross reaction and this occurs a lot in the body. In the renal system as well, you can have cross reaction to alveoli in your lungs, in your good pastor syndrome, etc. But you learn that as you go along. So T cells are implicated, right? And you know that T cells actually cause in your cytokines. And where there is cytokines, of course, it is calling other immune responders, right, to come to the scene and help. And one of the most common ones are your macrophages. 
so the macrophages from your immune system remember they can be antigen presenting cells they can do phagocytosis to get rid of organism etc right, so remember that we said that in 40 percent of patients they will develop pancarditis which affects all three layers of the heart so you have endocarditis myocarditis and pericarditis in myocarditis what we have as a main feature are your ashoff nodules which are giant cells and within them you have the anichow cells which are modified macrophages and in terms of their chromatin they have a central chromatin which is like caterpillar shape or wavy in appearance so in terms of your pericarditis is a fibrinous exudate that is formed remember in an immune response the body tries to heal by fibrosis so it has a saggy appearance and is very sticky you know and it is layered onto the pericardium and that's why they describe it as a bread and butter appearance think of it as the bread being the pericardium you have this thick fibrinous exudate being layered on it right like how you lay the butter on your bread so now let's look on endocarditis so in endocarditis you have valvulitis which is inflammation of your valve and in this case you have the formation of what we call rheumatic vegetations and these vegetations are formed from necrosis of your smaller blood vessels at the valves all right so remember that if there is any compromise to your blood flow small blood vessels will be affected right and if they become ischemic then you can have necrosis that is formed now remember that anything that affects the blood flow so if there is stasis according to virtuous triad there is the chance of forming a thrombus so thrombosis can be present um remember as with everything heals with dense fibrosis right the body is trying to heal by fibrosis and because of this fibrosis there's actually permanent damage to the valve right and so the valves become deformed and they cannot carry out their regular functioning and this is when it leads to rheumatic heart disease so rheumatic heart disease is when there's permanent damage to the valve and it causes them to be deformed right you can also have um, macallum plaques that are present usually in the left atrial wards but we're not going to focus on that all right so in terms of a rheumatic heart disease remember that we said that when there is permanent damage to the valve so basically valvular complications when you have endocarditis in your acute rheumatic fever now the valve that is most often affected is your mitral valve in two-thirds of patients are 66 percent and in 25 percent of patients you have both the mitral valve and the aortic valve being involved now remember that we say that you have dense fibrosis that occurs on the valve right due to damage to smaller vessels there and so you have calcification that can occur and because of this fibrosis and calcification in your valve um you can have thickening and distortion of your valve and also shortening of like your commissural um, fibers and your cardiac tendony and because of this the valve cannot perform its normal functions and this will lead to a lot of complication which we are going to look on so in terms of complication you can have stenosis in the mutual or the aortic valve and you can have an open orifice or a closed orifice all right so in terms of the open orifice the valve is supposed to close there is no blood that needs to backflow right into where it's coming from which is the left ventricle but in cases of an open orifice blood can seep through it's regurgitated and it goes back into the left ventricle when this occurs there's more blood in the left ventricle than it should and so what is going to occur is going to get bigger it's going to extend to accommodate this additional blood and that's why you have hypertrophy of your left ventricle right if there is a closed orifice right so the orifice is closed for example in the left atrium blood needs to 
be moved from the left atria to the left ventricle. However, if there's a closed orifice, this cannot occur. So what occurs is that the blood pools in the left atrium and so there is dilatation of the left atrium similar to the hypertrophy that occurs in the left ventricle with an open orifice and because of these um, remember virtues trial against stasis blood gets pulled in that region it can increase the chance of getting a thrombosis right and development of ar arrhythmias etc right so anything that affects the left side of the heart right can also cause pulmonary congestion and so this can lead to congestive heart failure where you have pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular hypertrophy also as we said before with rheumatoid heart disease it also puts the patient at risk for developing their in infective endocarditis right so you can have superimposed um, bacterial infection because guess what blood is a very very good culture for microorganisms all right so now we're going to look on infective endocarditis so largely in this region of the world infective endocarditis stems from your rheumatic heart disease as we said before however there are other causes of infective endocarditis so any abnormal valves prosthetic valve or in iv drug users they can be predisposed to getting infective endocarditis so as we said in the infective endocarditis um, is usually a bacterial infection and it occurs in the valves as we said before or the endocardium and it also leads to the formation of these vegetations that are present now there are different types of infective endocarditis which is important in terms of difference in treatment difference in prognosis and difference in mortality and morbidity so for your acute type you must not have any previous heart condition say so you are normal you are previously normal heart and it is usually caused by a very virulent organism example your staph aureus and so because this organism is so virulent it rapidly progresses right so in these patients it is very difficult to treat and it may require surgery to remove this vegetation but there is a high mortality that is associated with this in the subacute presentation right you usually have abnormal heart or valves prior to this infection and so it's a more insidious onset so weeks or months after you present is not as rapid as your acute type and it's usually not so much virulent organisms so lower virulent organisms such as the strep viridans right in more than 50 percent of patients and so it is slower and less severe in terms of valve damage and of course because it's lower virulent organisms it can be cured with antibiotics all right so similarly to your rheumatic heart disease it mostly occurs in your mitral and your aortic valve however um in drug users remember iv drug users are prone to infections it usually occurs in your tricuspid valve so as we said you have these vegetations which are basically fibrin fibrosis and necrotic tissues there's inflammation that occurs anywhere there's inflammation there's actually cytokines being released macrophages etc all right so what are the complications or what is the bigger picture to infective endocarditis no because there is destruction to the valve tissue and there's malfunctioning of the valve that can occur um, that can cause rather cardiac failure and where there is cardiac failure and there is infection it can affect the electrical conductivity of the heart and this can lead to the formation of arrhythmias now 
remember as we said before that there can be compromise to the blood flow or the components of the blood and this can lead to um thrombosis right or the formation of an emboli and this can actually move to different places such as your brain more commonly can cause stroke or you can even move to your organs and cause kidney failure or to your limb and cause blockage and cause ischemia in your limb and because of the microorganism remember it can travel via blood right so there's hematological spread that can occur and it can go to your brain and cause meningitis so that's it for infective endocarditis in a nutshell and that's the end of this lecture i hope you learned something um please reread the notes and yeah all the best thank you very much